This episode of the Better Every Ship podcast is brought to you by Lexical, the experts in policy, training, wellness support, and grants assistance for first responders and government leaders. To learn more, visit lexical.com. That's L-E-X-I-P-O-L.com. Now let's get into the show. Hey, everybody, Aaron Zamzo with a Better Every Shift podcast, or shall I say recast. Today, we are going to rebroadcast one of our earlier episodes that we did with Dr. David Griffin. David is a assistant chief with the Charleston, South Carolina Fire Department. He has really used um, some powerful lessons learned from the tragic fire that killed nine of his fellow firefighters. That was on June 18th of 2007. Um, And he's really used uh, that tragic event to propel a mission to improve himself personally and uh, the organization in which uh, he still works. Uh, I've really found um, his moving story and his passion to uh, be motivating, um, not only for me personally, but uh, hopefully it will be for you and your organization and and your crew. So uh, I won't spoil too much of the lessons learned, but uh, I will tell you that you will be able to get fired up about his passion for improvement based off of unfortunate, a tragic situation. So without further ado, here is our episode with Dr. David Griffin. Welcome to the Better Every Shift podcast. My name is Aaron Zamzow. Up there is Janelle Fasquette, the co-captain, the producer, the engineer, basically the brains behind the organization, except for today, Janelle, because today... Mm -hmm. We have one of the smartest individuals, I believe, in the fire service. We have Dr. David Griffin with us today. A good friend, a good mentor, a good person. How you doing, David? I'm doing well. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I mentioned that you're one of the smartest people in the fire service for many, many reasons. You've been inspiring a lot of us, including myself, for a long, long time. But let me just go through just real briefly your bio because it is extensive. Um... It's impressive. Bachelor's degree from the Citadel, master's degree in executive fire service leadership, doctorate of education, organizational leadership and development, certified CFO, CTO, CPSE, graduate of the EFL program from the National Fire Academy, graduate of Harvard University Kennedy School for Executive Education program, graduate of uh, psychology of leadership program at Cornell, uh, new business owner, started on a mission coffee. Uh, and that all started from, you know, super sofa fire that, um, you were involved with and really kind of started your mission and, um, uh, brought you to speaking internationally. And thank you so much for being here out of all the list of all your different accomplishments. What's, what's the one you're probably the most proud of? I'm glad to still be on the job in Charleston, working at the department that I've committed to, from the day I started in 2005 after the Sofa Superstore event to, to where we are today. And that's just not me. I'm, I'm just proud to be a part of an organization that's been through something serious. And uh, as of today, there's 57 of us left from the day of the fire, which there were 246 that day. So that's my most uh, proud uh, part of being in this profession is still being in Charleston because it's the place I love and it's the place I've committed myself to, to make better and to continue to progress every day. And I miss that. Like you're, you're the assistant chief administrator now in, in Charleston. Um, I am, yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. And you were, an, you were, an, uh, you're an operator on the first engine, first two engine, uh, in there in, in June in 20, uh, 2007. Correct. Um, you've authored four books now, I believe. Is that right? Four. Correct. Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, the last one is, uh, tattoos and trauma. Correct. Um, you also have in honor of the Charleston nine, a study of change following tragedy. I've gotten to meet you and talk to you behind the scenes and um, you are exactly the way that, you know, you present. I, I, and I respect the heck out of that. Cause you, like you said, Hey, you can ask me anything. We're, it's just like two brothers talking and um, you know, behind the podcast, I always say this, but it's true. Like we just, Hey, how you doing? How, how's shift? How's your family? You know? And, right. and so uh, it's, it's great to talk to you, buddy. So you're still in trial. So now you're a chief and, and you're still presenting and speaking. Absolutely. Um, now, now you're a business owner. And so how do you do all this, man? 
I, I have a lot of energy, you know, I don't sleep very much. I, I know I have one life, so I've always made it a goal of mine to live every minute, live your dash, if you will. It's kind of one of my things. So when I came on the job, it's it's something I've I've always wanted to do. Being a firefighter was very uh, inspirational to me. And then when the Sofa Superstore fire happened and I had my struggles after that, and then when I started speaking and that was therapeutic for me and then continuing to learn and educate and really coach and mentor the people that I work with every day, I'm very fortunate to still be there and be able to do that. And that's really my passion is to, to watch the younger firefighters in our organization. You see them, they're growing and you see people who were firefighters that day with me are now moving up through the ranks, the captain and acting battalion chief. And then you have others that have come in afterwards and they're battalion chiefs. And it's really neat to see the commitment that we've made to our newer generation, because we know we're not going to, we're not going to be there forever. One day there will be no one left from the day of June 18th, 2007. And we have to make sure we coach and mentor that next generation. Yeah. And you're doing a great job of that, by the way, I I've, I've seen you speak. Um, for those that are listening, if you get a chance to see, see you, um, I highly recommend it, you know, bring a pencil, bring an open mind. It's, it's a uh, very inspiring, you know, you've, and it, it's, it's cool. Cause I met you, you were a, a, a captain. Yeah. Captain. captain. And, and, you know, the day of you were a driver operator, you know, as you've gone through the ranks, how has that lens changed? You know, obviously it changes day to day, but what about looking back and reflecting on that day? It's really changed my thought process from that day, but to where I am today as well. As, as you grow and you mature in, in your life, really, and in your profession, you, you really change your perspectives and how you view what you used to do and how you used to be. And I know on June 18, 2007, I was very young. I was uh, uneducated. I really, I didn't know my job and that was my fault. I don't blame anybody I worked with. That's because I didn't dedicate myself and I didn't, I didn't believe the seriousness of this job. And that really changed my thought process. And unfortunately, a lot of us had to learn that very difficult way on that day. And it wasn't because we were bad people. It wasn't because we wanted this to happen. It's because we were successful for quite some time. And then you have a very seminal event and it makes you really start thinking about the ways that you do things. And so since that day and staying active and, and staying on the job and, and moving through the ranks, I've been very blessed to you know, I made engineer and then I made captain and then I made acting battalion chief and then I was a battalion chief and then I was a shift commander and now today I'm assistant chief administration. So I'm very proud that I was able to do that. And I will say I didn't have a lot of time in all of those ranks as some other generations before me because we had such a big turnover. So I'm always very knowledgeable of that. And I had to really mature at, at a quite a fast rate as some of the other people in the organization have. But what I think that's lent me and a lot of other people, we've had to grow up very fast and we've had to be uh, very knowledgeable about other positions. And I'm thankful for that because I know I think about things a lot differently today. When I look at specific events, when I look at, when I look at how you wear your gear, how you speak with people, it's just so different than uh, it ever was when I was a lot younger. And it's just part of growing up. And I'm, I'm very glad to have done that on this job after a significant event. Mm -hmm. You know, and you've spoken openly about how that, after that event that was so catastrophic with nine firefighters dying, uh, there was some resistance to change initially and not fully buying into the safety culture right away. I was just wondering if there's a defining moment for you that really changed that perspective on the safety culture. For me, I, I really didn't know a lot about the safety culture. I knew what I knew from a couple of years of being on the job. And it was the only thing that I knew. I had no other experiences being a firefighter. I didn't have fire one training or fire two training. I had no experience growing up in the fire service. So really my training was very limited and my knowledge of being on the job was very limited. So I did things a certain way and I was proud of it. And then I do remember when there was a couple of reports that were published after the event and they were very direct reports. And it had mentioned me as the operator and that I was inexperienced and I did not know my job. And there was a couple of articles that uh, said some very disparaging things about us about after the event. And that's when I really started to ask myself, did, did I not know what I didn't know that day? And that, that was the truth. So I started to really research pump operations and apparatus placement, all these things I didn't know. And it really opened my mind to the fact that I didn't know what I didn't know. And a lot of the other individuals I worked with, good people, good intentions, they loved our fire department, but we just didn't know what we didn't know. 
And I think there's a lot of organizations, not just the fire service, there's a lot of professional organizations that are that way. And we just had a very consequential moment to where we saw everything unfold in real time. Whereas there's many other organizations that they don't have that benefit, if you will, it unfolds to someone else and their excuse is, well, that never happens here. Well, you can say that until it does happen wherever you are, and then it's too late. And so that's one of my messages always is that you have to keep an open mind because an event like that can happen anywhere at any time. It doesn't matter how big your department is or how small your department is. And really resistance to change, it was high, as you can imagine. Think if you had individuals with 20 and 25 years on the job at a place, they loved the organization, they bled that fire department, and then something happens and everything that comes out afterwards says everything we did was incorrect. I couldn't imagine having that many years on the job and someone saying what I dedicated my life to is that it, it, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so I felt for all of them. And I still do today because we lost a lot of good individuals from retirement because it was just so much change at one time. It was just too hard to handle. Yeah. Going back, would you, would you want it to happen any other way or could it have happened any other way? You know, you mentioned that it, you guys, there was a lot of change. Was there, is there any other option than that? When something like this happens, you have to have some specific rules and you have to have a specific leadership leader in place, because if you don't, you're not going to be able to make these significant changes. And I know when chief Tom Carl was hired from Montgomery County, he knew he had to come in and had to talk with us and, and learn what we thought we needed. But he also knew that we had to have some very specific direct instructions on how we had to change. There had to be specific SOPs on the size of hose lines we're not going to pull on these commercial structure fires, supply lines, seat belt usage, things of that nature. And that's very difficult because there's a time to where you have to be very specific. And after an event like this, it's non negotiable. When you have all these reports that are coming out and they're asking, why do you do certain things? And why have you not done it as an You have to answer. So you're talking about how, you know, the organization had to create policy. Obviously, you have to stick to it now or else your, your organization's not going to grow, but you had mentioned yourself. So you started to look at how you can make yourself better, right? How can you educate yourself? Take, take me through that. So where did you start now? And this is, this was an undulation process, right? It wasn't just always uphill. It wasn't right. Like, oh, yeah. uh, you know, your driver, pumper operator, you're reading these reports. What, like, where did you start or where did you go from there? When I started to read these reports, there was specific terminology I'd never heard of. I didn't know what large diameter hose was. I wasn't real familiar with apparatus placement. I knew a little bit about that, but not in reference to a commercial structure and specifically a furniture store with that much of a fuel load inside of it. So when I started hearing these different terms, flow paths, these are things I had never heard of. And I asked myself, why don't I know these terms if this is my chosen profession? If I'm choosing to be a professional, why do I not know all of this information, the research, the technology. And that's really what kind of sparked my interest. But it wasn't right after the event. It took me a good three, three to four years for me to come out of my uh, funk, if you will, because I was just resisting change. I was having a hard time with the processes of, of hiring new firefighters. And I saw a lot of good individuals that were leaving the organization. I was really just confused. I didn't know who to follow. I didn't know who to trust, who to believe, because it's like taking an entire organization and throwing it up in the air and just, it just falls apart. And yeah. that's really where we were. And we had to figure out how do we put all these pieces back together and put them back, back together while you're still responding to emergencies. It's not right. like you take time out and we're going to stop responding. You're responding while you're trying to figure out how you're supposed to respond based on all this new information, this new apparatus that we're receiving, these millions of dollars that we're receiving. And it was just very, very confusing. And I know as I started to try to slow myself down and learn a lot of the different pieces of information that we were receiving, it was just so fast. And I, and I only had a couple of years on the job. So I couldn't imagine, imagine the individuals who had 10, 15 and 20 years. It had to be so difficult. One, well, as you're trying to learn all of this and kind of figure out the what you didn't know and what you need to know, how is that also connected in with what you're going through from a mental health standpoint, because that was such a massive event. And yeah. so, you know, there's the logistics, the operations side of it, but then there's the, the real human side of it too, of just navigating that trauma. 
it was something we didn't really think about because at that point, besides 9-11, there really wasn't a big push for mental health or any knowledge on traumatic experiences. So for us, the next morning I got off shift and I just went home. There was no clinicians. There was no hot wash. There was no critical incident stress debriefing. It was just I went home and I figured it out. So the human side of it and the mental health side wasn't something we really even thought about until you started to see a lot of guys that were having difficulties. They were drinking off duty. They were having difficult difficulties with their families. They were doing things that were just so off the mark that you really didn't understand why they were doing that. And then for me, I really started to feel that connection of the trauma and those flashbacks from that event because it was something that was just playing in my mind nonstop. It was like on rewind and I couldn't get it out of my head. And so obviously when that happens, you start to find ways to cope. And if you don't have a positive coping mechanism, you're going to turn to a negative coping mechanism. And so for me, it was uh, drink, uh, I drank a lot, unfortunately, there was prescription drugs and there was things that it, it started out very innocent and then it turned into something that I just had a hard time with. And uh, thankfully, I was able to get that under control in a matter of a couple of years and uh, my lifestyle was changing. But I saw a lot of people around me that were struggling with that. And there's still some that are still struggling today. And it's, it's hard to see that because you want to help them. It's just such a hard event to to move past if you don't have anything in place when the event happens. It's too late after the event. You have to have something in place beforehand. Yeah, that's a great point. You, you did the MMA stuff. I think you and I had talked about that, right? You're doing MMA. Was that was that kind of like was that the point where you kind of looked down and looked in the mirror and said, "Wait a minute, is this is this the way I want to go?" Was that what or what was that point? Well, I I did MMA for about four years, and as I did that, I felt. I felt better because it gave me an out. It gave me a distraction and I was really involved in athletics my entire life. And it's something that I was able to do to get that extra anxiety and those nerves out. But also what comes with that back then was a different kind of lifestyle. Now mixed martial arts today is much different. It's very uh, streamlined. It's more um, something you could watch with your family because it's more of a physical chess match. But back when I was fighting in 2008 to 2010, 2011, it was just a different environment. So it was, it was my way out really. But I noticed as I was doing that over time, it was, it wasn't really helping me. I was becoming more angry. I was training more than I was at home with my family. I was not doing a good job at work. I was resisting change. I was just not a very happy, good person, jovial person as I've been my entire life. I'm a very happy, go lucky, easy going kind of guy. And for that period of time, I just wasn't myself and I couldn't put my finger on it. Yeah. Were you and more intentional? Like, how did you shift from doing, discovering that this wasn't really working for you to finding healthier coping mechanisms? And were they intentional or did it just kind of happen naturally? Well, when you start out, you don't really know that it's not helping. You think it's helping. And then you <laughs> wake up one day and you think, well, I felt this way for years and nothing's improving. Why is it not improving? And a lot of the guys I was working with, they were starting to go to counseling. And as I saw them going to counseling, I thought I would give it a try because at first, when people started going, we were making fun of them. We were laughing at them or saying, I can't believe you would go to a counselor. And then here I am thinking, I probably need to go to talk, go and talk to someone. Mm -hmm. So I remember my first meeting when I went to do that, it was, it was really life changing. And I will tell you the first couple of minutes I was there, it didn't feel like that because I just didn't, I didn't believe in it at that point. I wasn't an advocate for mental health. I didn't have any knowledge or education on that. I was just trying to figure out my own life. But as soon as we started talking and we started to do a few techniques that the clinician had, I really felt a change in my behavior. I felt the change in just the, the nerves and the anxiety that were in my body. And I stuck with it and it took me a couple of years, but through different kinds of treatment and modalities, I was able to get that under control to where I can manage it. And now I have good techniques to be able to do that. And I'm thankful for it. And, and you, and then that's when you just kept going back, right? At this time, you're also educating yourself, correct? Absolutely. Like going back to, yeah, to sure. what? Well, that's when, when I, that's when I decided to go back to schools because when I was, I was going through a treatment with my clinician, she was asking me different questions and it was kind of prompting some thoughts that I'd always had because when I was in school, I went to the Citadel, which is a military college here in Charleston. So it's a, it's a really good school. I really, I always loved learning. I loved education. I actually, my bachelor's degree is in education. I wanted to be a teacher or a professor. So I was always really into that. And then when I came in the fire service, it was like a different message. It was, we don't want your education. We don't want you college boy. And I, 
I was like, wow, I was proud of that. So I pushed that to the side because I didn't think that's what people wanted from me. And so when I did that, I stopped learning. I stopped reading books. I stopped reading magazines. And it just, I just stopped learning. I literally just went stagnant. And so for those period, that period of time, I just wasn't growing. I wasn't maturing. I was just staying status quo. And then when I started talking with my counselor, she really started asking me questions about what I enjoy doing and what did I want to do from this tragedy. And that's really where I started thinking about more education because I realized I didn't know what I didn't know. There had to be someone else out there just like me who was 26 years old trying to figure it out and not knowing what they're doing, but they were good intentioned. And so that's why I went back to school. And once I re-enrolled and I started my first class, I, I was just enamored with the information. I couldn't read enough. I couldn't do enough work. And so I continued with that. And then I just, I, I graduated with my master's degree. And two weeks later, I rolled right into my doctoral program and I just kept on rolling and I just loved it. And that's why I'm such a big advocate for education because there'll be some firefighters that'll watch this and say, this guy's a super nerd. And that's okay because I, yeah, I am a super nerd, but I'm also someone that's been in operations my entire career before this last eight months that now I'm doing paperwork because I'm the administrative chief. That doesn't <laughs> hurt my feelings. I don't, that doesn't bother me because I know now when I'm doing paperwork as an administrative chief, I'm doing paperwork because I was also the shift commander, which was in operations. I was also the battalion chief in operations. I was also a captain in operations and I was able to learn what we needed in those positions. So now I have a different lens. So when someone calls and they ask a question, I'm thinking from their lens of the firehouse because I used to have the same lens and it really wasn't that long ago. I've been very blessed to move through the organization and I've, I, it's been nice to be in each position because I've been able to learn each position. Now, I, I, you know, I was a captain for four years. I was a BC for and a shift commander for two and a half years or so. And I've been a shift, or excuse me, I was a VC for four and a half years. And I've been an assistant chief now for 10 months. And so I've, I've been learning, but when I'm learning those positions, I'm learning them very quickly because I was just in the other position. So I'm like chief, one of our chiefs calls it marinating. I'm marinating enough to learn. <laughs> yeah. And so it's really good because I, I'm marinating and learning a piece that I just learn but now i'm trying to put them together to make the processes better so it's it's a, it's a really cool perspective man i know that sounds super nerdy but i, I just really enjoy it well I, you, what you're really doing is you're you're taking you know hey real world right i'm sitting in, in that chief's position sitting in that battalion chief's position, i'm sitting in that captain's position and then you're also getting it from the educational side saying like here are here are more effective strategies and ways to deal but you're able to, sounds like, mold them both together kind of at the same time almost, right? Or or, or you, you set your platform and your base and now you can apply it to the fire service. Because, right, like, isn't that one of the difficulties? And I think you, you touched on it a little bit. You know, the fire service is a different entity when they look at education and mm -hmm. training. And I, I believe that's changed a lot. But, definitely. you know, you learn one thing in a classroom, then you go in a firehouse. It's totally different. But, yeah, you know, What's, what's the, you know, that's the challenge, number one, but to you, what's the key? You know, what, what makes you be able to do that so well? I think the key is understanding that it's not just education. It's not just experience. It's a combination of both of those because education makes you see things differently. It makes you process things differently. It makes you communicate better. It makes you understand people's emotion, emotional intelligence. It makes you understand how they want to be communicated with, but it also makes you understand how to have self-awareness. I have self-awareness of my strengths, my weaknesses, and I, I'm okay with that. I know there's certain things I'm not very good at, and I know there's certain things I'm a little bit better at, but I'm not great at really anything. I just really try to do a good job at each piece, and I try to mentor those around me to really take what we do collectively and, and build it out into a very strong team. And it's something that I've really kind of taken – taken to when I was put into a position as a shift commander, I had a very good team of battalion chiefs. They were all senior to me. Uh, they all had taught, they all had taught me how to be a firefighter, a driver. And now I'm put into a position to be the supervisor of the shift. And I knew that I needed them. Our first day together, I looked and said, guys, I can't do this without you because you have more experience. You have more knowledge. I'm going to need you to help me and mentor me. And they did. They took me under their wing and they guided me and they helped me. And I will say when I left that shift to be assistant chief, that was hard because we had such a bond and we had our shift running. So it just felt so good. It was like a well-oiled machine and I was so pumped up about it, you know, and yeah. getting me all fired up talking about it. 
<laughs> but it, that's it's good. Something I love it's I, I love like building teams. I love putting people in positions to where they can be successful. And now it's it's pretty cool because in my current position, I have uh, five civilians who are now on my team as administrative pieces. So it's it's human resources, it's finance, it's admin assistant, it's a data and a data analyst. And so with those pieces, so now I went from 96 firefighters on a shift to five civilians. And so for me, it's such a cool challenge because it's, it's, it's a different way of leading. It's a different way to communicate. But I will tell you, taking that team and giving them their pieces of that team, they've made it absolutely incredible. Our processes are better. I, I can't say enough about this team of what they've done. And it's just because they've really bought into a system that's just working together and empowerment. I love it. It's just so much fun. Yeah. And you talked about team development. Like you're, you're a baseball player back, back in the day, you played minors, you played college four years, you know, Absolutely. and um, you know, we've talked to you just about how, how great the fire service is when you, when you change and when you flip to like, Hey, I'm going to try to give back and, and educate and, and kind of help bring up the next generation. Absolutely. Right. There's, there's many reasons to do that. And you and I talked like one is we don't know it all. They have something that, to offer number one, number two, it's just, it, it, you try to leave things better, um, which you have done in your messages. Uh, how many people have you presented to over the last couple of years? Uh, we've been presenting for 10 years. It'll actually be 10 years next month. And so from our numbers that we've taken attendance, it's over 200,000 people in the last 10 years. So you, that's your team, right? Like have you ever, you ever step back and look at, like, I have a team of 200,000 people people that I've impacted that really feel kind of that same way. Yeah, it's amazing. I, I can't imagine, you know, that's just the people that I've been able to speak with in person. That's not my uh, Zoom classes I've done. That's not through just writing and, you know, different articles and books. And it just blows me away because I'm, I'm nobody special. I mean, I literally, I consider myself being a nobody. I'm, I'm just a person that started in the fire service, want to be a fireman. And, and I say fireman because that's what I thought back then. And as I worked through, I realized I learned the differences of, of being a firefighter and I learned the differences of being a driver and a captain and a BC. And so I've matured and I think it's, it's, it's kind of weird and it's kind of neat. I mean, the fire service has watched me grow up in the last, I don't know, 16 years going from somebody who was as bad at the job as you could imagine to someone who takes pride in it. And I'm not saying that I'm good at the job by no means. I'm saying that I take pride in it and I try to give my best effort every day and now, as I know that I'm not in the street doing the job anymore, and I think that time has obviously ended for me, but the part that I do now is to make sure that the people who are doing the job that have the processes and have the leadership and really that, that mentorship they need, as you were talking about, because I want it to be better. When I leave, I want the next person in my position to be better than me. That was my goal when I left as the shift commander. I said, the next person that's in my position, I want him to be better than me. And I, there's someone that have, we mentored and we guided and he's making his way and he's doing really well. And he's taken the processes we had on our shift and he's made it better than I ever made it. And I love it. It just, every time I see him do what he does, it just like. Gets Fires me. you up. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it almost like brings a tear to my eye because I know that he, he bought in, but he also had his own talent and his own, his own journey, but just knowing to have a part of his development and knowing that now he's going to take that and develop the next person and someone will buy in and it'll last long after I'm gone and I'm just a name on a wall or nobody. And I mean, that's really what it's about. You, you want to make it better than you found it. And hopefully we're doing that. Your passion isn't about, it's not only about telling the story, it's about telling the story so others can learn. And when others learn and develop, that's what really gets right. you fired up. Absolutely. Because that's what's going to be here long before or long after we're gone, right? And, and it's it, it gives me goosebumps to watch you get so fired up about leaving that mark on other people. And you're doing that. Do you ever step back and say, holy cow, I am doing that? I mean, you yeah, it's, it's hard to you know understand sometimes. And if I'm working on something and I start looking through things we've done or where we've been, I, I, I look at my wife sometimes and I'm like, I don't know how I did it. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. It's, you know, 10 years and 800 different places or more I've been. And I, and I say that as humble as I can, because I don't, I don't even know how that was. How did that even happen? I don't, I don't even know. And just the, so many people I've met, uh, the people that have influenced me when I go to these organizations, I meet 
their fire chief, their deputies, their assistant chief, their firefighters, their recruits. And, you know, I'm getting perspectives from all over the place. And I'm just like trying to be a sponge to suck all this in because, I mean, think about those conversations over the last 10 years from all of these different, I mean, different organizations and different countries. And I'm like trying to take it in from what they do in Canada, what they do in Mexico, like what they do on the slopes when everything's frozen. I'm like, how do you, do, how do you even do all this stuff? I don't even know. And so it's just like, I can't get enough of it because I just, every trip I go on, it's, it's a totally new adventure with new people and, and new processes that you just never even seen before. It's, it's yeah. so cool. Well, and it's pretty amazing to watch your journey too. We've known each other for a very long time and to see how you transitioned through everything that happened after that seminal event to here just last year, you wrote an article for us called uh, 15 years later, we are home growing our leaders in Charleston. That really just underscores so much of what you're talking about where you're taking this moment in your life and everything that you've been doing and putting that passion toward building uh, the next generation of leaders there, which is just phenomenal. And it's just, it's, it's been a, a real joy to watch this transition in your career as well. And just, you know, to see how much things have changed over the years. It's been, a, it's been really interesting. I saw a guy the other day and he goes, man, I saw you speak in like 2015 or 16 and I just saw you speak today and you're like grown up. I was like, <laughs> what do you mean I'm grown up? He goes, no, that's a good thing. Like you're still in my face. You're still giving me the message, but you're just more crisp with it. You're not as emotional or as you were. And you're just, I was like, well, I, I take it as a compliment. He was, he, what he was trying to say was it was just interesting because he hadn't seen me you know, in 10 years and a lot can change in 10 years. And I was, I was really taken back from that because it kind of gave me a little bit of a, a, a tear to my eye because I realized that, man, I, you just don't, you don't know that. Like every time you see someone and you speak with them, they, they hold on to that feeling. And I, I always have to remember that because I, you know, I was at a conference last week and I saw a lot of people and they were you know talking with me and it was so nice to, and every interaction I have, I always have to remember that because this may be the only time I ever see that person. And they may have seen me on a podcast or seen me teaching and they, they, they may, they want, they want to talk and I want to talk with them as well. And I want to make sure that every time someone meets me for the first time, it's like, man, I, that was awesome. I, I don't want to ever, I put a lot of pressure on myself because I don't ever want to disappoint someone because I want them to realize that I live my message. My message isn't something I do because I'm bored. It's not something I do because I just, I need something to do. I live my message. I go to work. I live my message. I, I do what I do every single day. And it's something I want other people to see if they can do that too in their department, because once you get a, a, a like-minded people doing that, it's pretty incredible what you can get done. It really is. Yeah. Has your message saved you personally? It would absolutely have saved me. I, there's no way I would be here in my life. I, I know, and I say this as open as I can, the success in my life has come from the worst day of my life. And I'm, I'm honest with that because I, wh what was I supposed to do? Am I, you, you want me to not do anything? I, I, I'm just not built that way. My dad always, my dad always taught me to be resilient and to not let anything break you or beat you. And for a few years it did. And then I finally woke up one day and said, what am I doing? This is not me. And so I've taken a little different route and some people agree with it and some people don't. And I'm totally understanding of that. And I don't have no judgment of that, but my journey is my journey. And I, I can't help how I deal with it. And one of the messages, or well, that is my message is, is how I deal with it. And I'm hoping that it inspires other people to do that. I don't want other people telling your story. I don't want a line of duty death to happen in some town. And then someone comes in from another town and says, hey, I'm going to tell your story. You don't know yeah. the story because you, you don't know the culture. You don't know the city. You don't know the people. You don't know the intangibles of the entire event because you just don't know. It doesn't mean it's not good work. It just means it's a different perspective. So that's, I'm trying, I want to inspire other people to do that. And from what I've seen, there's been a lot of people that have come out from these different events and are starting to talk about it. And that's, it's so awesome to see that it's, it's, it's exciting. Well, you are making an impact because you're still very sought after and you're still traveling and touring. And you said something earlier in the interview here, you said, live your dash, right? Like you're Absolutely. just trying to live your dash, but part of that is you have to find your dash too, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I always feel like I've been looking for my dash. It's, you know, <laughs> 
I'm all, I was always doing something. I went from baseball to bodybuilding to mixed martial arts fighting to Ironman triathlons to CrossFit. And then it was always something trying to find my message, but also that would inspire other people. It's all, it's just something I always had when I was an, an athlete. When, even though I was on a sports team, I was always trying to get in the huddle and give a, you know, two minute speech to get everybody fired up and go out there and play well. And it just, it kind of always came natural to me because it's just my, it's my passion coming through. It's, it's, it's not something I try to do. Sometimes it just comes out and I don't even know that it comes out. I don't know if that's good or bad, but it is what it is. It's genuine. And that's, that's really, I think, you know, that's why I gravitated towards you right away. I'm like, like I said earlier, when we started, like, this is you, like you haven't changed your intensity hasn't changed to help people and get back and, and help people find, you know, what their path is. And if you can be that like uh, voice to help them do that, man, yeah, I mean, you're doing it. I think the cool part for us or for me, I can, it's like, I see you now, like I, you're living that man. You're, you're living. You're, it's like, this is what you're born to do, right? You're doing yeah. it. And mm -hmm. it's fun to watch, you know, for those that know you and for those that follow you. So that it, it's like Janelle said, it's just been great. Um, and I can't thank you enough for being on, on this too. Cause you know, you and I, we've had these, some great candid talks. Um, but I don't think I'm the only one. I think you would have this talk with anybody, you know, like if, if sure. people want to ask you stuff, man, you're, you're always there and honest. So, um, I think that's why, why you're so successful, honestly. I appreciate it. I always just, I'm genuine. It, I do what I do because it means something to me. All the other stuff is just kind of in the background. It, it is what it is, but I'm, I'm very thankful to be able to take a bad event and try to try to make a positive out of it because I don't want those nine individuals to lose their life and not thousands and thousands of thousands of people to keep learning about them. It, it's pretty neat when you stand in front of a crowd and you can't speak any, I can't speak any Spanish. You stand in front of a crowd and you have a translator next to you and for an hour, you speak for two sentences and your translator translates it and you point to a slide and then you do it again. That is unbelievable. The feeling that is to look in that crowd and I, I can't communicate with them. I, I know what they're thinking. They know what I'm thinking. But the translator next to me is communicating my entire message. And when he's doing that, he's got the same mannerisms on my face. He doesn't have these veins popping out, but he's still <laughs> as excited as I am. And it's pretty neat because I'm over there trying to hold it together like. I, I can't even uh, understand how this is possible. It, it just, it, it's so, it's such a humbling experience because I know the people that this message has impacted and it really, it's turned into to my life's work. And, and I'm proud of that. I, I can't, I'm just, I'm just proud to still be speaking about something that's important, but it's not just about that. The most important thing is when I'm speaking about a message, I'm speaking about the message I'm living in. I'm doing it every single day on the job. I'm not retired. I'm still doing the job. And I think that's what really resonates with people. And that's why I think they come and listen to the message. You know, with, with such a passionate message and energy and after such a huge event, I have to imagine that there might be a sense of obligation, right? To keep spreading the message, keep spreading the message, get it out there. But at the same time, that puts a lot of pressure on you. So how do you find balance in that that's not necessarily connected to on a mission, but it's about you and your family, making sure that you have time for them and all that. How do you find that that balance? It's, it's definitely difficult because when I'm in, I'm all in. And I think if you talk to anybody who really knows me, they know that anything in my life, it's been 100 percent. I'm all in and there's no there's no in between. I have one. I have a gas pedal. and I have no brake pedal. And so my wife always laughs at me because I just don't know how to stop. And I think that is one of my challenges, because with your strengths comes your weaknesses. And I think that is a strength of mine. But I think it's a weakness of mine because I, so there's some days I have to back off. There's some days I have to not do so much and spend more time with my family or spend more time with my friends. And I'm, I'm really trying to balance that, but you know, exercise has always been my thing. I can turn to exercise. Um, I work out a lot. It's probably why I have uh, issues at such a young age with different joints and different uh, muscles and stuff like that. But I'm really trying to change my recovery aspects of it. I'm doing a lot more cryotherapy. I'm trying to eat a lot cleaner than I used to. Um, but really it's been exercise. That's always been my constant since I was a little kid. When I felt stressed or I felt nervous or I had anxiety, I'll go and get a workout in and, and I'm leveled out.
and I'm feeling much better. But it's still something I'm working on. It's I don't know if I will ever master it. And I really don't know if you ever master anything. I think we're all a work in progress. And it's something I want to get better at because with more balance becomes more joy in your life. And that's really what we're all striving for. Well, and I think that's a great message, too. It's just a reminder of the folks who are listening right now. Even you are still on a journey. Even you are still, you know, have elements of your life that you're still trying to figure out. It's not like we just get to some point in our life and it's like, we're done growing. That's sure. it. I know everything yeah. I need to know now. Yeah. And I think some people think that they think I have it all figured out and I, I absolutely do not. So please don't think that I am still a work in progress, but I know when I wake up in the morning, I'm excited about getting up. I'm excited about going to work and I'm excited about new challenges of the day, no matter what it may be. I may be doing a spreadsheet I've never done before and I get excited about it. I know that sounds, <laughs> but I just love, I love to learn the processes. I love to know how things work. I love to know how the background works in this entire machine that's called a fire department. And I just, I can't get enough of it. And I, you know, that could be a strength and a weakness of mine, but I really am just a student of the game. And it's something I was taught when I played baseball, be a student of the game, learn as much as you can be a sponge and, and just try to talk with a lot of people. And I, I just try to listen too. I try to listen a lot so I can learn more and it's, it's really engaging. Well, and that's the attitude. Cause I was just going to ask, I'm like, what, what would you tell somebody who's kind of going through a lull in their career? You know, maybe they're in their five year and they're just going, Hey, where do I go from here? Maybe they're their 10 year or 15. I'm like, what would you tell them? You're going to have lulls in your career. There's going to be times to where you're going to work on shifts for years at a time in a certain position. That's okay. I'll go back to what I was saying. You're marinating that position. And please don't think that's something I coined. Or actually, our fire chief, uh, Chief Dan, coined that. He said that one day and it was pretty neat. But he's right, though. You are marinating in a position. So every day you come in, whether you're an engineer or a captain, it gives you that chance to really perfect your craft in that area. So if you're the captain and, and you're working on your morning briefing, you get 10 days a month to work on that morning briefing. So every day you do it, you're getting better at it. You get 10 days a month to go out there and train with your, with your firefighter, with your driver. And so there's all these opportunities that it's not just going to work for your shift. It's going to work to develop yourself for your crew and for your shift and your department. If you do that over 5, 10, 20, and 30 years, when it comes your turn to be a captain or a battalion chief or an assistant chief or whatever your dream is, then you're ready to do that because you've taken every shift serious. You've marin you marinated, you've learned, and it's just really cool to see when people buy into that. It really does work. Yeah, It fires you up too, right? Like yeah. whenever anybody goes through a lull, you know, even with fitness, we always say, well, we change the program up a little bit or learn something new or try something different. Same thing with education. Absolutely. You know, so spot on, my friend. We could keep talking about this, but we got to do something called the hot seat and put you in it and ask you some questions, man. Not not just like they're they're random. That's kind of been growing, though. We've, we've actually had people I've had a couple of people say, hey, you got to ask this as a hot seat question. So and yeah, so what? It was my mom that said that. But that's one of our two listeners right now. So we're going to ask you awesome. uh, some questions uh, about uh, just anything. And here's here's one's kind of a, a little bit about. Uh, you know, leadership and well, I'll just get into it. What's the one non fire related book everyone in the fire service should read? The five dysfunctions of a team. Ooh, okay. Who's that by? Uh, Lencioni. Okay. Any particular reason why? What What's the biggest thing? It's a, so the interesting part about the book is the name kind of throws it off because when you hear the name, you think it's got a negative connotation to the book. It actually does not. It's actually a short story about a team and there's a new leader that comes into the team and this leader is able to highlight the, the issues with that team. And what you see is people are starting to gravitate towards being better. Some work themselves out of the team, but it's an easy read. It's like who moved my cheese, basically that book, okay, good, but it's, an easy, it's a story based leadership book. And we had actually just read that in our organization with some leadership we did with our senior staff. So we read the book. We had uh, someone come from the outside that wasn't in the fire service. She was a leadership uh, uh, professor, basically. And she came in and she taught us about our behaviors, uh, the different types of behaviors that we um, resemble when we're stressed out and when we're having these different types of communication issues. And it was really cool. So I think that's a great book. Awesome. That's awesome. I'm, I'm pretty sure we've had a few writers reference that book in articles. So uh, we'll good. include a, a link to that in the show notes, too. Awesome. Um, all right. Speaking of books, you wrote a book about tattoos. Did 
Good. What's your favorite tattoo and why? Uh, my favorite tattoo is the one on my left leg. It's a, a large, it's an old timepiece, but with the timepiece, there's a chain on it. And the timepiece has a specific time on there from the event of June 18th, 2007. And as you, I'm looking at it, as you look at it, you can see uh, how the time and where the hands are struck. And it's basically when we were dispatched out to the fire. So that's really uh, my favorite because it's something I look at every day. It reminds me of why I do what I do. And that actually came from, I have an old grandfather clock in the, on the, in my house. And when you walk in, people say, Hey, your clock's not working. And I say, yeah, it's absolutely working. Look at what time it is. And it's the same yeah. time I have tattooed on my leg. It's intentionally not working because of that, because that's the moment that unfortunately changed so many lives. And I can go back to that every day and say, it's really one of the driving forces of my life. That's very powerful. That's, that's good to have that reminder with us all the time. Absolutely. All right. So lightening it up a little bit. Uh, what's your best dish when you cook or when you uh, air quote cook maybe for the, <laughs> for the station? <laughs> so I've really gotten into smoking food. Ah, so I have yes. a smoker. Now this isn't a fancy smoker. Now my buddy TJ, he's a, he was a guy in my battalion. So this guy would bring this giant smoker and I would just watch this dude. Like how in the world does he know how to smoke this meat? So he would smoke a steak. And then he would take the steak and he would sear it for like two minutes on each side. So he taught me how to do this. And the first couple of times I did it, I mean, I literally destroyed the meat. It looked like the bottom of my shoe. So I've worked on that like the last couple of years. And I can say today my best meal is a seared steak after I've smoked it for a couple of hours. Thanks to my man, TJ. Impressive. Impressive. I'm getting hungry. It's really it's really been cool. Like in the firehouse, smokers uh, like uh, up here too in, in Matt and where I am in Madison. Every firehouse now, you know, they pocket it up, and and there are, there is some little competitions going on between them, but it is it's an art form. It, it it's it's not easy. So that's Absolutely. that's interesting. So I got one more. This is uh, one that um, I personally always love to ask. What are you working on right now to improve you? So next week, I'm actually going to Leesburg, Virginia. So there's an uh, the International Association of Fire Chiefs has an a class called Fire Service Executive Development Institute. It's for individuals who are interested in uh, maybe one day being a fire chief. And, and so I applied for the program last year. I didn't get in. I applied this year and I was thankful to be accepted. Um, so next week I start that program, which I will go on Saturday morning. I will go there and I will return next Friday. So it's about nine days of that class. And then during FRI, we go back for the second part of it. And then in the fall, we have a third part. And then next spring is the final part. So that's the first piece. And then there's uh, the South Carolina State Firefighters Association. They have a leadership institute that I'm participating in now. I just started that as well. So that'll go throughout this year. And I'll graduate in the spring of next year as well. And that was someone in our organization had taken that. Um, uh, his name is Alex. And he told me about it and said he recommended it. And I wanted to, to learn like he did because he said it was a really beneficial program. Can I ask one more question here? How do you organize your day to get all this in? I'm not really sure, but uh, no. So go, going to a military college, they really taught you a lot about time management. And I remember one of the first things I was taught is that uh, you manage your day. So my, my day doesn't manage me. I manage my day. I wake up early, extremely early. I always laugh when people send out pictures of the time they get up because Man, my dad did that for 40 years and I've been doing it for most of my life. So it's not a big deal to me. I get up early and I do my thing. So I get up early and whatever I have structured that day, some days I work out first thing in the morning. It depends on like how high intensity it is and how my body's feeling. Uh, but some days I'll get up and I'll work on, you know, different things I have for my speaking schedule or uh, for our coffee or whatever I have to do. And then I make sure I'm at work um, at, a, at a good time. I usually get there uh, anywhere between that 6.30 to 7.30 time frame, depending on what I have going on during the day. And then I do my normal day and then I come home. And when I get home, I'm either doing a podcast with you or I'm working <laughs> on something else for a speaking event we have coming up or I'm trying to spend some time with my family. But I'm very structured um, with what I do. And I think that's a strength and a weakness because I am always doing something. And I think I have to work on that a lot more because I'm not able to have those small conversations throughout the day that I really need to have because I'm always I mean, I'm just 
I'm moving. Like one of the people I work with, they're like, they keep telling me you're a force of nature and we just get out your way. So <laughs> that's a good thing. And it's a bad thing. I'm aware of it and I'm trying to work on it. Fueled by on a mission fire and mm. uh, not fire coffee and fire from within Absolutely. Uh, is, is our Dr. David Griffin. And, you know, thanks so much again for being here. We could, we could do another hour of this, um, yeah, but I good. need some more. I, I, I needed some more coffee in order to do that. Yes, sir. Hey, yes, sir. thanks, brother. Great to see you. Thank you. Thanks uh, for having me. And for, for those, I mean, we covered a lot, man. We covered leadership. We covered your passion. We covered, you know, just your journey. Thanks for being so honest with us. If someone's just listening to this and is kind of searching for, man, what can I take from this? What's the one thing you want them to take from, from this Better Every Shift podcast episode? The saddest thing in life is wasted talent. Don't waste your talent. You have one life. You have one dash. Live your life. Do what you want to do. Be successful. But you have to do that. You have to put in the work. You have to put in the effort every day. And you have to be passionate about your craft. And if this is what you chose to do, then use that talent and make it better and, and make it better for the people that come after you. Awesome stuff, man. I love the 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 live your dash. And it it kind of goes with what we say at the end of uh, every podcast. And I'm going to add this. Live your dash. Learn something. Do something. Share something to make you and those around you better every shift. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Dr. David Griffin, for all your passion. Keep doing what you're doing. And uh, we'll see you again soon. See you again soon. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.